Ryan, as you evaluate your offensive line through eight games, uh, where are they at and just how much have they improved since the first game? I think we took a step this week. Um, you know, where we go from, from here, we'll see. But I thought, you know, we ran off the ball better. I thought we got good movement. I thought, um, you know, Trey ran hard. And, you know, that, you know, combination of things really helped and boosted our run game. So, um, you know, we'll see where that takes us on Saturday against Rutgers. But, you know, we want to be playing our best football here down the stretch. And, and that's a big part of what we've been focusing on. You know, this time of year, you want to be enhancing the things you're doing well and, you know, improving the things that you feel like you need to improve on. That's been an area for sure. Um, but there was definitely a step in the right direction. What does Trey give you guys that maybe you don't have without him? Uh, Trey gives us um, the ability to hit home runs. Um, you know, Trey's very competitive. He's versatile. He can do a lot of things in the passing game and the run game. So having him in there makes our offense much different. Uh, third row right, uh, Dylan Davis. Dylan, where is that? Kind of building on that Trey question. So given that he gives you the ability to hit home runs yeah. um, in an otherwise struggling run game, is it important that you give him those 24 carries or whatever he got against Wisconsin? Given that he can maybe change the game with one run where I mean, you're not generating against us run game. I guess you know what I'm saying there. Tim only gets three questions. He was late for the press conference today, so he only get only gets three. Tim, um, yeah, I I think we we always have to find ways to to get Trey the ball. Um, our playmakers, whether it's again in the run game, pass game, across the board, and uh, I think he ran twenty four times in this game, and that, that was that was a healthy bit for him, especially you know coming off of a couple week. Uh, you know, um, you know, time where he wasn't on the field, and um, but we, you know, we worked hard the week before to get his wind up, so he was able to do that. Then real quick on Emeka, is he still in line? Yeah, we're, we're expecting him to practice this week. Um, he was available for the game on Saturday. Uh, we just didn't feel like he was quite quite where he needed to be, and uh, had a bunch of guys step up for him. But um, you know, looking for a full day of, of work here today, and then and then a full week, and then going in. You know, we want him to be to be full go. But he was ready, and he's working hard. Um, he's a tremendous young man. I mean, just the attitude he's had that he wants to get on the field, and you know, he's forced, you know, others to, to pull him back, and that's the attitude you want to have. And that, you know, is a great sign for your team when guys are just fighting to get back on the field, and he's one of them. Stephen Mead, Cleveland.com. A little bit more on Trey. You guys made a concerted effort to get him going in the past game as well in that second quarter. What does he give you? And does when you're trying to get the running backs involved in the past game, but you're also trying to get the tight ends involved in the past game. Do they kind of take away from each other when you're trying to get the ball spread around more? Well, you know, you have the the matchups that are the most noticeable, which is the receivers and the corners, and and then you have different zones and, and man that you know you got to identify. But um, ultimately, what you're trying to do is space it out versus zone and and win against man to man. Um, our, our tight ends, you've seen Cade do some different things when he's got matched up that in a favorable matchup that he's won on. And, you know, you've seen our, our running backs do the same thing. And, um, you know, all of our guys do really well out of the backfield. But but you can see certainly the explosiveness of Trey when he's out there. And that's just not something that's that's happened in you know, this past game. He's done that in the past, too. He's got, you know, um, big catches. I think his first big touchdown in Minnesota was, was a, a screen pass. You know, the, he caught a big one against, you know, um, Maryland last year, you know, so, you know, he's always been a weapon out of the backfield. Kyle, I know you're not going to develop if he's injured or not, but if that, if you're dealing with a lower body injury as a quarterback, how can that impact you as a thrower? Well, you know, this time of year, you're going to have, everybody does, you know, you have things that, you know, um, bumps and bruises and things, and, you know, there's a difference between hurt and being injured and, Another example of a guy who, you know, really fought through it and, and showed toughness in that game. And, and that's, you know, once you get in November, that's what's going to happen. You know, you got to play depth and guys got to work through um, those type of things. And, and you know, those, you, know, you talked about, um, you know, some different guys already today, but there's a, there's a handful of guys that was that way. And, you know, he showed his toughness in that, in that game. So, um, you know, that's why we, we had to get back in here, get healthy this week and have a great week of practice. Uh, yeah, you talk about you know this run that you're going to go on here in November. It's something you know you brought up since the end of the Wisconsin game. Just what have you learned through your first few years as a head coach 
about November maybe that's different that you, you've taken and you can now apply to you know these late season runs? Well, I just think the biggest thing is every week there's issues that you have to address. And like you said, you learn every year different things. You know, you learn uh, so much. You have to, uh, you know, take a self-assessment after every season and figure out the things that you did well and the things you got to improve on, the things you learned, and you got to get them fixed. And I think, you know, as you look at this season, you know, we, we've said we want to play our best football in November because, you know, that's, that's where the, you know, the biggest games are. So it's been a constant build. That's been the message. Doesn't, but along the way, you got to win every game. So what does that mean after a game and you win? You have to identify the issues because they're there, whether you win or lose, and get them fixed so that when you get down the road, you know, you're at full capacity. Tony Gerdman, Buckeye Huddle. Ryan, with respect to the injury policy, what's the timeline on Devin, if you can update uh, anything there? Again, you know, it's hard for me to talk specifics, but you know, we're expecting Devin to practice today. You know, in what capacity, we'll, we'll see. But um, you know, we're, we're going to see him out there today. And then, what are, what are you missing when you don't have a Mecca? Um, you know, Mecca is um, a warrior. He's productive. He's tough. He's a great leader. Um, he does a lot of things for us. Um, you know, that being said, you know, I think Xavier Johnson has done a really nice job stepping in. I feel like Julian has, has stepped up in, in other ways, you know, not just in, in the passing game. And, and certainly Marvin has done a great job. Cade, you know, the guys have stepped up when he hasn't been out there. But, you know, having him back um, does open up a lot of different things for us. And, um, you know, it's well documented, his production since he's been here. And um, again, when we have all of our guys out there, you know, we're full of capacity, then, you know, we're the most dangerous. Um, and, but that doesn't mean we haven't got a bunch of guys that stepped up and they've kind of found different roles and, and, you know, you could see a little bit of that kind of showing itself on Saturday night. Rob Aller, one of the best. Ryan, uh, how did Kyle grade out? You know, he, he had some, you know, really good snaps. He, um, you know, if you were grading whatever number of plays, there was a lot of pluses there. Um, you know, the, the, the thing that's hard about a quarterback is, you know, one play can ruin your whole day. And there were some, some critical errors in there that, that um, you know, that hurt us. And he knows that. So, um, you know, nobody's, you know, more critical of himself than he is. And, um, but, but there were still a lot of good things out there as well. So we got to, you know, eliminate the things that, um, you know, can hurt the team. And, and certainly the turnovers are a big part of that. I mean this more as explanation an excuse, mm -hmm. but is there, I don't know if you golf. You I know, do. Is there such a thing as just having a bad day? If you run into that, are guys allowed to just not be feeling it that day? No, no, I, no. And, and I think it's a mindset. You know, you're not allowed to have a bad day at Ohio State, any of us. That's just the way it goes. So I say all the time, on your bad days, you have to at least be average, at the very least if not better than that, you know, on your average days, you got to be really good on your good days. You got to be great. And, um, I think playing quarterback is similar to playing golf. What I mean by that is each individual play, each individual shot is affected by the last play or the last shot because of where you are situationally, but it has nothing to do with anything. Only thing that matters is that singular play. But, you know, if, if you hit the ball in the water on the 18th hole, you know, you can ruin the whole, the whole four days of, of golf in, in the PGA. Well, it's the same thing playing quarterback. And so I tell those guys all the time that they should play golf because sometimes you have to manage the round. Some days, you know, maybe your swing isn't where it needs to be and you have to figure out how to manage that, that round. You got to keep the ball in the fairway, maybe put your driver in the bag. When it's feeling good, pull it out and hit it right down the middle. There's a lot of parallels there. And I think you see a lot of quarterbacks who play golf. There's, there's some of that that goes on. And so um, I have suggested in the offseason for those guys to play a little golf. I think it's, it makes sense. But, um, but yeah, to answer your question, you know, there's, you know, how many 80 some odd shots or 70 shots, depending how good you are at golf. And, you know, each shot is its own individual shot. It's the same thing when you're playing quarterback. Each play is its own individual play. And you have to play that play. You can't let the last one have an impact on what you do on the next one. You know, in the off season, yeah, we talk about that. Yeah, just, you know, and even now, you know, you can't let what happened in the last play because there's a lot of variables. And, um, 
you know, if, if you're sitting there letting that play hurt you on the next one, then now you're really hurting the team. So um, I, I think if you're looking at the positives there in the second half, you know, Kyle was able to move on and really even, you know, have a voice there in the last drive to tell him if we, if we turn this into a two score game, we put these guys away. And so that was all positive there that he was able to move on from that because some guys struggle with that. They can't quite get over what just happened. And all of a sudden, one bad play makes a bad day, and now you're in trouble. So um, I thought that was good in terms of his resilience. Uh, Andy Bax from Letterman Row. Uh, Ryan, with Kate Stover, zero targets on Saturday. Is that a non negotiable for him in terms of getting him the ball, or is that just the nature of the tight end position that sometimes? It so wasn't for the lack of trying. Um, you know, there, was a, there was several plays that we designed that didn't go his way. You know, sometimes that, that does happen, um, but he played a great game. Um, you know, he was, um, you know, battling through that whole entire game and, and he, you know, he's another warrior there now. I mean, just unbelievable captain, great player. And, you know, Willow is going to try and find ways to get him the ball. What's the tight end depth beneath him and G right now? Yeah, G Scott is, is the two right now. And then, and then after that, um, you know, some inexperience. So, um, you know, going to work a bunch of guys this week and, um, you know, possibly get him in the game so that, you know, as we head into, you know, the, the home stretch here, you know, guys have some game experience. Um, you know, you've seen us use different guys in that spot. You know, well, we've been in 10 personnel. We've been in uh, personnel. We bring Luke Montgomery into the game to be an extra tight end. So we have a couple different options there, but we'd like to build that depth as well. Uh, far right, Adam King, WBNS. Did you see anything from Kyle after Saturday that maybe you hadn't seen from him yet? I mean, obviously, it didn't go the way he wanted in the locker room between the game and now. How, how does he handle it, and, and do you see anything that surprised you? Well, I think uh, when you have a couple bad drives, you, you, you kind of get your almost back up against the wall, and you got to respond, and I thought he did. So I think that was that was a positive. Um, and, you know, he did get banged up in that game and fought through it, you know, and, and then showed leadership down the stretch. So, um, you know, always trying to identify the things that we got to get better at, but the things that we need to improve on for sure. But, you know, there was some encouraging things in terms of his response to what happened. When you look at a moment like that as a quarterback, how much does having a guy like Marvin Harrison Jr. just become just kind of a, an outlet at that point? Oh, yeah, that's very important. Um, you know, you just, it's a comfort level. And, you know, those guys have been playing together for a long time. And, but it's not just Marvin. It's some of the other guys as well. You know, when you have really good players around you, you have a comfort level and a confidence that those guys are going to get open and you can deliver the ball. Are you uh, pole watching or trick or treating tonight? I'll be watching film of practice, Clay. Yeah, right here. <laughs> yeah, a whistler on my neck. But you'll take note of uh, the CFP. You know, for us, we, we have to win this week. And, you know, I say that every year. And you know, I think it's great for the fans. I think it's great for football to talk about it. But ultimately, we have to continue to win and, and, uh, and win out. So. That's our focus, and um, we're just going to take it one week at a time, and then we'll come up for air at the end of the season because that's what the ultimate, you know, ultimate, um, you know, rankings are going to matter after, you know, the Big Ten championship game. Tom's very WBNS. What's your biggest concern going to Rutgers this week? I don't know if it's it's you know concerns. I think when you, when anytime you go on the road uh, in the Big Ten in November, you know, you got to bring it and. Um, you know, uh, they're doing a great job. Greg does a great job. Um, you know, they're, they're playing well on both sides of the ball. They have a great identity. They're going to challenge you in, in all three phases. So, um, you know, again, I don't think it's it's a concern other than just the fact that, you know, we got to go, um, you know, continue to take the next step as a team. And that's that's it. What about expecting the unexpected against him? Yeah, um, you know, creative in, in a lot of ways, um, certainly in special teams and, and tries to attack you. So, you know, we got to have a good plan for that. And, um, you know, we, we have, you know, some real veteran guys who are aware. And um, so we'll challenge them and, and, you know, make sure that we're sound in, in all those areas because they, you know, they do a great job with that and are creative for sure. Far left, Jared Smalley, WCMH. Hey, Ryan, obviously with Greg being back at Rutgers, you know they're going to play good defense. And they are, statistically they are. I'm wondering, when you look at the, evaluating them through the season, the way they've played, some of the better teams they've played, especially on defense, really, really strong against the pass. What do you see on, on tape that gives you an idea of why they're having some success? Uh, and, you know, a combination of good players. I think the, the, the talent has been upgraded. 
Um, I think they do a good job schematically and, you know, play complimentary football. And, um, yeah, I just think it's it's all those things. And and so that's why we got to do a great job of preparing. And, um, you know, each week has its own challenge, and, and this is just another version of it. When you guys recruited Davison, was the hope that uh, – it was the pitch, hey, you get to play as your brother? <laughs> no. No, but uh, – but no, you know he he and his family and you know they they've um, you know they it's it's been uh, you know, such a great addition to our program having Davison here. You know just his competitiveness, uh, the way he comes to work every day. He's a pro, and um, you know we're we're awful glad that he joined us. Uh, right in front of him, Nathan Baird, Cleveland.com. Right after the game, you weren't even really aware that what exactly had happened with Lathan. Do you have a better sense now that that that's going to be long term, or do you guys got lucky? Uh, yeah, um, yeah. I think you know we'll probably have an update later in the week. We're still trying to figure out kind of the timeline on that, but um, but yeah, we definitely have a better idea, just not definitive. Um, in general, oh, in a season like this where the offense hasn't been quite as efficient, scoring isn't quite as prolific, is the calculus for you changing at all on when to go for it on fourth down, when to kick a field goal in that plus territory, maybe especially in the red zone, fourth and short, those things. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, you know, the, the two spots in particular on third down. Um, you know, I'm, I'm as the coach, I'm going to take responsibility. That you know, I'm, it's my responsibility to make sure that doesn't happen. We can't get, you know, pushed out of field goal range in those two situations. So, you know, you want to be aggressive, um, but you know, I look back and probably should have run it in those situations, added a few yards to it, and kicked the field goal um, to make it a two-score game. But, you know, want to be aggressive and throw the ball. Um, got pushed out of field goal range in both of those spots. So I've got to think through that a little bit. So, and ultimately, that's, that's, that's my responsibility. So um, I, I think, you know, we've got to make sure in that spot we turn that into a two-score game, especially with how well our defense is playing. Do you look at it maybe differently this year than you would have looked at it last year, two years ago, three years ago? Um, you know, I think our defense is playing really good football right now. And based on how the game is playing out, you know, you try to get an idea, are they in control of the game? I felt like, you know, the last couple of weeks, our defense has been in control of the game. And based on that, you know, you try to make the best decision to either make it a one, two, three score game in that spot. Um, you know, I think we'll have to talk about, you know, game in, in, in particular when it comes to that. But um, remember, the goal is just to go one and oh every every Saturday. And uh, that's our job. Now, again, we don't turn the ball over in the first half. You know, it doesn't have to be as close as it had to be. But but that's that's our challenge for this week is just play cleaner, and um, you know I tell our guys all, all the time we're in control. You know if if we play clean, if we play well, you know then then you know it's not as much of a game in the fourth quarter as it was last week. But but Wisconsin's a very good team; they're very well coached, and so is Rutgers. And so you know playing in this this conference is is not easy. And so we'll keep grinding and keep pushing, you know, to play uh, perfect football because that's what we want to do. With Kyle dealing with that injury, do you have to manage him any differently, whether in practice or even in the game, just to try to keep him healthy from a stretch run? Um, I, I think you're always aware of, you know, um, you know where guys are at. It's a long season, but you got to do what you got to do to win the game too. Um, so that's always a balance that you try to strike for sure. And just with if Rutgers, do you see anything different in what Rutgers is doing this year in terms of their success than maybe you've seen in past years going against them? Um, just offensively, they um, you know have a different scheme, very similar to what Minnesota did a few years back. Um, you know, same coordinator. You can see a lot of similarities to the way that they're playing, uh, controlling the ball, um, and then obviously playing well on defense. Uh, Austin Ward, uh, Ryan, when, podcast. You, when you got late in the third quarter and, and Kyle wasn't putting any weight on that left ankle, and you had a little bit of a layoff there between the quarters. What were the conversations like, if you had any, with Kyle before he went and got on the exercise bike? That, did you think maybe about putting Tristan in to finish that game? What were what was going on in the sideline there? He's tried to get feedback on, you know, what exactly is going on. You know, where are we at? What can we do? What can't we do? You know, are you 100 percent or you're not? Just get rolled up, those type of things, and and then you do, you know, you make the decision on where you're going next. But. But he said, look, I'm going to be fine. Don't worry about me. I'm good. And so, again, just showed a lot of toughness there. It, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting it was a, a right or wrong decision. I'm just wondering how it played out. Because it, you talked about a Mecca fighting to want to go play. 
and Kyle didn't look like he was at his full effectiveness. Like, how much does that weigh in the back of your mind? He wants to do it, but maybe, maybe that wouldn't have been the best thing on Saturday. You won the game. I'm not. I'm not sure. arguing about the result. Just, well, I think what you do is you try to determine what gives the team the best chance to win um, you know, in that moment, but also moving forward. And you try to identify it the best you can and, and make the best decision you can. Um, I actually thought, you know, Kyle in the second half, other than a couple a couple plays, played much better than he did in the first half. So, um, you know, that that was encouraging. Um, you know, if we saw something that was just, you know, radical out there that, you know, um, then you make the decision based on that. But we felt like where he was at, you know, he could still function and, and you know, made some good throws. Pat Murphy, 24-7 Sports. Ryan, when um... – Justin was first starting, talked a lot about throwing the ball away, same with CJ. Obviously, that was a topic with, with Kyle this past weekend. How much conversation have you guys had about that? It just doesn't seem to have come up in these settings as much. How much have you guys talked about it individually? Um, yeah, you talk about it all the time. You just, you know, where is, um, you know, why are we calling the play? What's the design of the play? Uh, when it plays out like that, you know, trust your feet, trust your eyes. When it doesn't pl play out like that, you know, where is your outlet? Where's the ball going? What's your plan? And then when it really breaks down, you know, what's your plan there? Because you you, you really can't come up with all the scenarios that may happen, right? Um, the second play of the game, the ball's down by his ankles. He doesn't quite see the read. You know, like how do you, you know, you can't get out in front of all these different things. Um, you know, zero pressure on a, a certain situation. Um, you know, all those types of things. And so... We just always talk about having a plan and constantly going through what may happen on this play. And, um, and so, you know, for the most part, I, I feel like, you know, he's done a good job of that. But, but um, you know, there's some, certainly some things that we learned coming out of this past week that, you know, I know he's going to want to get better at this week. And, and then, you know, same thing on my end, you know, making sure that, you know, as coaches, we're putting him and I'm putting him in the best position to be successful. And so, you know, we all have to look at that and make sure we're doing the right thing. In that same vein, I think, had a number of intentional grounding penalties. I know some of those have been maybe questionable, but when, when you look back, is there a connection there or something you guys can, can address with him to avoid that situation? I, I think it's, um, again, trying not to put him in a situation like that, but also, you know, just having a plan and an outlet for, you know, when things break down, you know, what, what is your answer? You know, where is that ball going? Whether it's breaking contain and then it has to cross the line of scrimmage, or if you're in the pocket, you know, making sure you have somebody in mind in terms of a receiver to make sure that it, the ball is in his range so that something like that doesn't come up. Spencer Holbrook, Letterman Rowe. Randy, Randy said after the game that Marvin needed a few more targets, he thought. Um, but other than Marvin, the rest of your receivers... That's every game. <laughs> <laughs> but receivers not named Marvin only had four targets. Is that not enough? And what do you have to do to get Julian and Carnell? And I'm sure it's going to change when Mecca comes back. You'll get those guys more involved. Yeah, um... Just try to um, continually find different ways to get guys open and, um, you know, keep pushing the envelope on it. You know, I think it's week to week. Um, and we ran the ball. Um, I forget how many times we ran the ball in this game, but um, we ran it a bunch as well. And we got a little bit of rhythm going in the run game. So, you know, um, maybe didn't have as many opportunities for those guys. And, um, you know, there were you know, a couple intentional groundings and things like that that maybe were designed for certain guys that didn't, didn't um, you know, show up. but. Um, but no, we're, we're going to try to spread the ball around the best we can. Bill Rabinowitz, Columbus Dispatch. Yeah, um, second play of the game, you re referenced the low snap on that play. The three interior linemen end up blocking one guy if that allowed the blitzer. I'm sure in the eighth game of the year, that's not something you want to see. I mean, you said there's progress in the offensive line. Is there enough progress? And then where does it stand? Well, that play in particular, um, the guy who blitz was hot. And the play was designed to to block the two guys off the edge, and, and Kyle didn't quite see him coming. So, um, you know, he said once his eyes went down, he couldn't see him. You know, if if his eyes were up, he would have seen that that was a pressure, and the ball would have gone to Trey. And we had two blockers out in front of him, and probably would have been an explosive play. Didn't happen. Those are the things that you know we just have to clean up. Second play of the game. You know, it's like you just you know pound your fist in the in the ground because it didn't quite happen. Why? Well, the snap was a little bit low. Didn't quite see it. So, um, so the line was sliding to the right on that play. So that was everything about that was exactly how we designed it. Other than the ball didn't go to Trey. So uh, I thought the blocking on the perimeter was excellent. I thought Josh Simmons th did the right thing. I think you know in that moment he has to block the most dangerous guy. He felt like the defensive end was the most dangerous guy. The linebacker came from depth, 
So I thought he made the right decision there. A lot of sometimes linemen will get nervous and say, well, I got to I got to squeeze inside and let the defensive end go. He didn't. I mean, he really did a nice job. The line was sliding to the right there. You can see the end drop. Uh, we were hot in that situation and didn't quite execute it. So uh, that play in particular, uh, we got to execute better. I thought the design was right. Everything was being executed. We just didn't get it there. Um, so between Carson and Kyle, we just got to get that right. Um, but just to answer your question overall, yeah, I mean, every play you can look at and try to um, – you know, ide identify you know where the faults are. What you know, and there's enough to go around. You know, there's there's some good things for sure, and some things we got to get better at. But I just think overall, you know, when you look at how we blocked in this game, certainly in the run game, there was a lot of progress. Um, some things in the pass game, you know, we got certainly have to get better at. Do you have an update on Mayan? Yeah, uh, I do actually. Yeah, Mayan Mayan's actually going to be out for the year. So um, you know, you know, you know. Feel really, um, you know, bad for mine that you know he's not going to be able to play. Um, you know, had a procedure done, and um, so you know they let us know that he's going to be out for the season. So, um, you know, mine's done a lot of great things for us, and you know, um, you know that's a big hit for for that room and for our team. But um, you know, the good news is we have some good depth in that room, and Tony's done a good job of building it. Had a procedure, or will have a procedure? Oh uh, yeah, he had a procedure done. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yep. I uh, no, no different. Yeah. So. Ron, any idea on, on my, I think he, has, he still has eligibility left to it. Any, any idea what his future will be? No, I, I don't think that that's, uh, you know, been, you know, really, I, I think I'm sure that, you know, he's considering, you know, what, what his next steps are here, but I think it's all so new. He's still trying to just, you know, focus on his, his rehab, and then we'll kind of address that as we get closer to the end of the season. Other thing, uh, Lorenzo Styles is at the, I think, the four game mark. He's at, He's got three. three. Yeah. Um, but what's the any any of what the plan is for him this year? Because he, I guess he's more got more one more game to play in. He'll, he'll, the plan is for him to play in one more game, and then and then kind of go from there. Um, so you know, we just felt like if we needed him and there was an emergency that we were going to put him in the game. Other than that, we were going to try to hold this year for him to learn the position, get better. Um, you know, play in those four games, and then um, you know, keep that red shirt. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Uh, sorry about being late, by the way. It's all right. Uh, uh, number one, is is there a knack to running an end around your know, jet, whatever you want to call it, and does it look like Xavier Johnson, you know, looking for the cut up, I mean, I think it's key there, yeah. and look like it's, that's coming on for him. I mean, do, do you agree with that? What do you see there that's, that's promising? Because that kind of developing more into a weapon. Yeah, he's um... – he can he can you know run all of our run plays. You've seen him run counter last year. You've seen him run the stretch play inside zone stretch uh, from the offset. Um, the play in particular that you're talking about is a play that um, you know, the 49ers have kind of made popular there with Debo Samuel. You know as a receiver and you know Mecca's run that play in the past. You know it it takes you know a a guy who has some running back skills. You know a bigger guy who like you said can you know look to circle the field and then and then upcut when he needs to and then kind of find his way through. But um, you know, it certainly, uh, you know, fit last week and, um, you know, he's got a good knack for that, like you said. And, uh, you know, as you, as you uh, just briefly, happy Halloween to everybody. We had our, uh, annual Halloween party at the office last night. I shouldn't say party. It's like, what is it like? Trick or treat. 30, 35 minutes of all the, uh, families and all the kids kind of walk around from office to office and, and get candy, which has been awesome. And then we go to we go to training table, um, but that was great. Um, appreciate you guys coming out like always. Um, kind of get into the summary of the Indiana game, turnover battle we've won. That's That's been probably the most consistent storyline of the year and something that, that I take a lot of pride in, and I think we've done a really good job of that. Um, explosive play battle, uh, you know, Indiana won that. Our defense did reach their goal. Offense did not. Uh, third down battle, we won that. Uh, sack battle, we won that. Drive start battle, we won that. Penalties, uh, we did not win that. We did not win that. Some more summary of the game. You know, when you talk about players of the game, uh, on offense was Catron Allen. On defense was Denai Dennis Sutton. And on special teams was Tyler Warren. Uh, 
just just kind of want to say this and be clear about this. You know, obviously stats play a factor in this for us in, in our winning grades each week, but really it's about how they grade. Um, had a had a player talk to me this week about, you know, uh, how the staffs do it. The offensive staff does it. The defensive staff does it separate. Uh, I'm not involved in that. Um, but, you know, you got to be productive, but you also got to have a winning grade and feel like, let 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 the stats alone. Um, you know, play play winning football from a from a coach's grade perspective. From a D squad uh, perspective on offense, we had Golden Chumba and Emil Davis uh, on defense. Jace Tuddy and and Jake Wilson. Uh, Jace Tuddy and Jake Wilson have really been awesome all year long. Uh, and then Finn Fermanek, uh, local guys doing a really good job for us on special teams. You know, just a few last points, uh, the positives. You know, obviously we won. And I thought we were resilient. I think right now our special teams over the last couple of weeks uh, is really playing well. Uh, and I think it starts with our specialists, Gabe, Riley, Dazanski, Falcons, and I would throw Hardy, obviously, in that as well. I think that group um, is really playing much more consistent uh, and making plays. Uh, Hardy's a weapon for us right now. Um, and, you know, I thought as a team we made plays when it mattered most, and then we won the middle eight. That was that was an important stat in that game as well. Opportunities for growth. You know, we're tackling too high. Uh, we need to wrap and, and uh, consistently wrap and tackle lower. Uh, and then we got to protect the football from a decision-making standpoint and from a fundamental standpoint. And you kind of get into Maryland. Um, obviously, I got a lot of history with the university. I was there, I think, for eight years. It was kind of my first big break in the profession, so I got a tremendous respect for, for the university as a whole and the athletic department. I uh, was there for a long time, um, two, different, two different times. was with uh, Coach Loxley. Got a lot of respect for him and what he's been able to do throughout his career. Uh, we were at the University of Maryland, I think, from 2000 to 2002 together, I think three years, if I'm remembering that correctly. Uh, you know, when you kind of break them down on um, offense, another guy that we're familiar with is Josh Gaddis. Uh, Josh, we were together, I think, for six years. We hired Josh from Western Michigan at Vanderbilt. We're there three years and then three years at Penn State. <clears throat> so know Josh very well. Josh is running the offense, doing a great job. Their 11 personnel spread team. Guys that we have respect for uh, is obviously uh, their quarterback, um, wide receivers, uh, number six and number one, uh, Jay Sean Jones and Caden Prather. And then their running back, Roman Hemby. Uh, we, got, we got respect for those guys. There's other guys as well, obviously, but it, it really kind of runs through their quarterback who's been playing there and been productive, owns every record that the university has. Defensively, Brian Williams. I've known Brian for, for a long time. He's done a really good job um, at Maryland and really throughout his career. We got to know uh, Brian when we were at Vanderbilt. We recruited a young, guy, young man by the name of Jakari Thomas out of Godby High School. And uh, Brian was the defensive coordinator at the time at Godby High School in Florida. Uh, guys that we've been impressed with is number 11, uh, Ruben Hippolyte, their, their middle linebacker. Uh, their linebacker, number one, Jay Sean Barnham. As you, as you guys know, um, uh, we recruited Jay Sean very heavily. Um, got a lot of respect for him and his family. And then safety number two, Bo Braid, uh, has done a really good job and been playing them for a long time and been playing for them for a long time. Uh, James Thomas, their special teams coordinator, I don't know him very well. Um, but Braden Wislowski, we've been impressed with him as a local kid uh, who's, a, who's a kickoff return guy for him and got a touchdown on the year. So uh, open up to questions. Let's go to Rich Garcia, Garcella and then Mike Gross, you're on deck. Hi, James. How are you today? Hey, Rich. How are you? I'm well, thank you. James, how would you evaluate your run defense, especially in the second half Saturday? Um. You know, obviously, I don't think in general on Saturday we played our our best football. Um, you know, we've arguably been the the best defense in in college football. You could be a part of that argument. 
Um, but I know Manny was very honest and transparent, uh, you know, with the defense on areas that, that we got to get better. That was kind of goes hand in hand with the point that I made about tackling as well. Um, you know, but we've we've obviously played better. You know, we've obviously played better. I don't think there's there's any doubt about it. So, um, you know, we worked on those things on Sunday. We made the corrections that needed to be made, um, and I think we'll be better for it. Let's go to Mike Gross and then Donnie Collins. You're on deck. Good afternoon, James. Hey, How Mike. Um, I love the fact that your description of the Halloween celebration included the term training table. I like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we walk up there afterwards. I I took my costume off because I didn't think that would go over well, or it would go over too well. Um, but yeah, then we always go up to we always go up to dinner. Monday night is family night anyway, f- from a dinner perspective. So so it just kind of fits our normal routine. But that 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 was obviously that wasn't my question. Um, I was hoping it was. <laughs> um. Um. You you said the other on Saturday, uh, you know, any win is this is obviously true. Any win is a good win and it's hard to win Uh, on the same at the same time. We've heard you say that you can't allow the final score to sort of hot sort of distract you from the issues that the team might have either way. You know, so how do you balance those two things, not only in talking to the public, but in in the coaching part of it and talking to the players. Yeah, I think, I think, well, first of all, to your point, um, I think there was three teams ranked in inside the top 17 that lost to unranked opponents on, on Saturday. Um, So I guess your point and the point that I made is we're never going to make excuses um, for winning. You know, um, at the end of the day, that that's what it's all about. And they're they're all going to be different. Right. They're all going to be built differently in, in how you get there throughout a long season. But to your point, um, after wins, um, you have to be as transparent and as honest uh, as you can be with yourself as coaches and as players. Um, but then also be able to have those conversations, uh, head coach to assistants, uh, head coach to the players, assistants and coordinators to the players. And, you know, Devon said something in the locker room. Devon Lee's, you know, I'm really proud of. Um, I'm, I'm going off on a different tangent here real quick, but uh, I'm really proud of Devon in his total development really since he's been here. M- maybe – one of the more impressive developments that I've seen in my 13 years. I'm just so proud of him in school, in football, and and as a leader. And he spoke to the team afterwards, and what he said was something that we talk about a lot. The best teams are honest teams, and you got to be willing to have those conversations with each other. That's it's 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 to me it's always at its best when it's player led, right? When the players can hold each other accountable and have real conversations with each other, whether that's at practice or in the locker room or on game days uh, or Saturday nights. Um, I, th- I think it's always best when it's, when it's the players. But to your point, you know, we got to be able to peel things back and have honest conversations um, and, and, and look at things and, and check the data and see what the data is saying because we have to win and we have to find ways to get better. Uh, but there's a lot of ways to get better throughout a season. And sometimes it takes a, uh, an ugly game. Sometimes it takes a setback. You, you, you hope it doesn't and you, and you wish it doesn't. And you do everything you possibly can to learn after wins and not have to go through those setbacks or those challenges. Uh, but sometimes it's needed. Sometimes it's needed. Let's go to Donnie Collins and then Johnny McGonigal. How are you doing, James? Hey, Donnie. Hey, uh, how do you evaluate the play of the offensive line the last two weeks? Uh, how do you think they're playing well uh, over, over that time? And in what ways moving forward do you think that they could improve? Yep. Well, I think, I think the first thing is across the board, 
and specifically the last two weeks, you know, we, we got to play better. We got we to continue to get better and, and grow. There's no doubt about it. I think what happens specifically with the offensive line is I don't care what offensive line you're playing or what quarterback is back there. If you're not good enough on first and second down and you're in obvious passing situations and people can just tee off on you and twist and game, that's challenging on, on the best offensive line. So um, we got to manage it as coaches. The players have got to execute to allow us to stay ahead of the sticks. I mean, you look at some of the, the, the best sack teams in the country, that's a stat that can be skewed because they don't ever throw it. And when they do throw it, it's typically manageable third down situations. Um, so for us, I think we have to continue to play better. Uh, we got to continue to develop depth uh, so that when we lose guys, the next guy can go in and, and play at a high level. Um, but then on top of that, we have to execute and play better on first and second down. And we got to manage the game as well. Are you going to get some third and longs and some obvious passing downs? Yes. There's no doubt about it. But obviously, you don't want to live in that. And, and there's probably too many third and longs over the last two weeks that has impacted that. So it's a combination of, of both, if, if I've answered your question. Johnny McGonagall and then Ben Jones. Hey, James. How we doing? And, and, and one other thing to Donnie, I'm sorry, is, is – also, obviously, the opponent factors in, too. All those things factor in. Sorry. Yes, sir. All good. Um, yeah, you mentioned Josh Gaddis uh, in the opening statement. I think this will be the fourth time you guys have faced him as a play caller after he spent three years in Michigan. Uh, given the film familiarity there, you know, does that help at all from a game planning perspective? And how different is this Maryland offense uh, with Josh uh, to the one that you guys faced uh, last year? Yeah, I, I think, you know, you, I get this question a lot, actually, you know, whenever we play someone like this. And I think the answer is pretty typical, right? We know them, but they know us as well. Um, you know, what I would say is I think it's similar to how Maryland has been in the past because you got to remember, I think Locks and, and Gaddis were together in Alabama. Um, I think – they're, it's probably more aligned at, at Maryland than maybe even Michigan. You know, obviously the head coach has some influence on the coordinators. It's not like it's exactly the same wherever the coordinators go. Um, but um, I think we have an awareness of who Josh is. I think it's similar to what Maryland has done. That's probably one of the big reasons why Locks hired him. There's familiarity there. They don't have to change the offense and hire a new coordinator to come in. They can build on what they're currently doing. And then there's obviously things in Josh's um, personality and, and philosophy that are probably um, magnified uh, and other areas that are probably decreased uh, based on you know, the previous coordinators, so on and so forth. So um, I think it's a little bit of both. We, we know him. Uh, he knows us. Go to Ben Jones and then Mark Wogenrich, you're on deck. Hey, James, how's it going? Hey, Ben. Um, I was curious what you feel the tenets of good quarterback development are and if there's a difference between or, or what the differences are between developing a quarterback that's maybe a more traditional pocket passer compared to maybe a guy like Trace that had the ability of his legs differently than Drew does. And is there anything that you learned from – Christian's career that translates to how you're working with Drew of a, a thing that maybe given another chance, you would have done it differently this time or et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So I, I think when you're talking about, you know, developing the quarterback, it, it obviously starts with, with footwork, um, you know, and mechanics. Um, but I've talked in great detail in the past about, about the mechanics Drew's one of the few guys that I've seen that, that has really changed. Um, typically, it's a footwork game. If their feet are right, then they have the ability to be in rhythm. 
um, and be accurate. So you got to spend as much time as you possibly can uh, in the footwork. The other thing, obviously, is being able to play to that quarterback's strengths. And the challenge with that, right, is there's so many factors that go into it. Um, the offensive line, the running backs, the tight ends, the receivers um, play a major, major part in that. You know, when you talk about the mobility of Trace and quarterbacks we've had in the past, then that opens up a part of the playbook and also changes how people defend you. Um, people are less bold when you have a quarterback uh, that has the ability to beat you with their, their feet. They're, they're more cautious about some of the blitzes and some of the defenses and things that, they, that they'll, that they'll uh, call against you. So all those things kind of factor into it. Um, but I've been pleased with, with his development physically. I've been pleased with his development mentally. I think we got to do a better job of also helping him and making plays for him. He's got to be more consistent with some things as well. Um, and then I think the other thing that, that goes into this as well is, right, there's a lot more to being the quarterback at a place like Penn State than just running the offense and, 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 and managing uh, the games. There's a lot that goes into it for, for the first time. Um, I saw that with, with Trace. I saw that with Sean Clifford. Um, and now, obviously, we're seeing that with, with, uh, with Drew. So um, I'm pleased with how it's going. Um, but there's, there's obviously a lot of room for growth there, not just specifically with him, but the pieces around him as well. You know, the, I, the last thing I'll say, because we've talked about this a lot, um, is I also think the explosive plays help. You know, uh, when, when you're able to complete a ball like we did with Keandre, the more times you can put that on tape, that affects the defense very similar to a mobile quarterback. It gives them things that, that they, they fear, that the defense fears. It's like the other day we threw a go ball, it wasn't a long one, Verse cover zero to Theo. To me, if, if you can make a defense pay for playing an overly aggressive style, then you're going to get less of it. So the more times you can do that, the better. If you throw like a slant versus cover zero and they tackle you, even if it's for a first down, you could make the argument it, it was worth it because you are putting pressure on the quarterback and putting him in a tough spot. You're putting pressure on the offense and the offensive coordinator. And some of those, you're going to get sacks. And if the other ones that they win go for six to 10 yards, then it was worth it. Where if you can beat them for a touchdown to throw it over their head, then that changes things. Very similar to how a mobile quarterback scares a defense as well. I, I hope that answers your question. Let's go to Mark Roganrich and then Frank Bodani. Hey, James, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, good, thanks. Um, do you have an update on Trey Wallace? And then in conjunction with that, how did Malik McClain play Saturday and where is he on his developmental arc? Yeah, so um, no, no announcements on Trey. Um, Malik McLean, um, I think, is like a lot of these guys. Um, I think I've spoke a bunch about Malik and, and how he's been since he's joined our program. Um, one of the harder working guys on our team, always a smile on his face, has been very impactful on special teams uh, and on offense in practice and in games has shown some really good signs. Um, but it's about consistency. I think you know that's really kind of always the measuring stick, uh, not just for wide receivers, but but at every position, uh, the guys that that you know are starting or playing significant reps are the guys that have shown the most consistency in practice and shown the most consistency in games. Sometimes I think that gets skewed for the players because. 
Um, they may be being consistent, but they're doing it against different competition. If you're going against Kalen King every single day at practice, that consistency is judged a little bit different compared to going against somebody else. Um, so that factors into it as well, that the competition that they're going against. But across the board, it's, it's about consistency. And, and Malik's doing some really good things, and, and we're excited about him. Um, but it's about doing things in practice, and when he gets the opportunities in games, just being as consistent as possible. And that's not just Malik. That's, that's all of us. Thanks, Matt. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Appreciate being here. Um, just as Matt said, I'll, I'll talk first about the team, the game, uh, most pressing thing right now, and then also a couple comments about yesterday's announcement. Um, you know, first of all, just uh, uh, going back a little bit, uh, coming off a of bye week right now, and that's you know. Um, Sometimes a good thing, sometimes a bad thing. But uh, this time of year, it really was helpful for us. We were a little bit banged up physically. So uh, it gave us a chance to, to rest our players have been playing pretty extensively, uh, give them a mental break also, you know, cut back a lot on what they did, and then also move some of the younger guys forward. So uh, it's always a good opportunity for the team to move forward, and hopefully uh, that's what we got accomplished last week. So certainly we're back into a, um, you know, uh, game day mode or game week mode and uh, right now our focus is entirely on getting ready for the game in Chicago. Um, you know, captains this week we still uh, have three of the same four, Joe Evans, Jay Higgins, Luke Lachey and then Logan Leo be our fourth captain now. Uh, and then injury wise, you know, pretty good health at least it looks like at this point. Uh, TJ Hall is still out but I think uh, fairly realistic to say everybody else have a chance to play and a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit healthier than they were last time we were on the field. So certainly a good thing. Uh, Northwestern, just talk about them for a little bit. Uh, look at least to be a team that's really playing well, playing with confidence, playing with energy, and uh, I think showing improvement week to week. I think their head coach's comments reflected that yesterday with his press conference, and I would verify it just, you know, having a chance to watch them right now. Um, I think they're uh, really, you know, gaining momentum and uh, playing with good confidence, like I said. Um, and, you know, got a new quarterback here who's played the last three games. Seems like he's really, I uh, was a catalyst for him Saturday, uh, doing a really nice job out there. And basically uh, two things that really kind of stand out to me. If you look at last week's game against Maryland, they had a seven-point lead. Uh, Maryland took, it, took the ball down to the one-yard line, had three shots from the one. And uh, Northwestern got three stops, which is pretty impressive, pretty difficult to do. And then more impressively, uh, Northwestern took the ball and drove it, whatever it was, 77 yards, and got a field goal out of it. So basically went from the uh, uh, Maryland had a chance to tie it up. And next thing you know, Northwestern's got a 10-point lead and really took control of the game from that point. So I think that says a lot about them. If you go back to the Minnesota game earlier, uh, the fact that they were down significantly, came back, scored 21 points in that fourth quarter and then one in the overtime period. Just tells you, I think, that a lot of people are doing a lot of things well up there and uh, their players are responding. So uh, that being said, you know, we just uh, look at this. It's another uh, tough Big Ten road game. Expect it to be competitive, uh, really competitive and really tight. And uh, you know, I'm guessing both teams are looking at it that way as we go into it. Kid captain this week is uh, Lincoln Veach, a young guy from Makokota. And uh, Lincoln's uh, story is this. He was diagnosed with leukemia at age four. Uh, it was complicated by a life-threatening uh, infection during his treatment time and uh, spent, uh, I think, like 100 days over in the, the Stead Family Hospital. So uh, pretty tough road there. Uh, Ten surgeries, chemotherapy, still on chemotherapy and advancing, getting better. And uh, he's a kindergartner right now, amazingly tough young guy. And we'll be thinking about him and his family this week when we travel over to Chicago. So just a couple words about that. Uh, regarding the announcement yesterday, just, you know, briefly address some, um, you know, the announcement that came out of the AD's office, and I suspect you'll probably have questions, so we'll take a few of those afterwards. Um, and just uh, basically say this, okay, for 25 years, tried to operate with a singular focus of uh, doing what I feel is best for the program, and that's mainly the players and everybody that works in this building. That's my first obligation. Uh, and basically, uh, my, my philosophy, my practice, I think, has been pretty consistent. Typically, we go through the season and then run an evaluation of the program top to bottom uh, afterwards. And, uh, you know, yesterday's announcement certainly a departure from that practice, but that's really what we've tried to do for the past 24 years. Um, so, you know, 
final analysis, you know, just uh, let's say this. I'm really proud of our players, proud of our coaches. Uh, I think they've done a good job over the long time. And uh, what we do now is move forward. And you know, our focus is on getting ready for this ball game. Uh, and then, you know, bigger picture, all four games. But, you know, decisions are made on Saturdays are based – Player was based on us watching the guys during the out of season, in season. Uh, you know, a lot of hours of evaluation time we spend with them just in uh, classrooms, all those types of things. And, you know, just really, really proud of our players. I think they've done a great job. Our staff's done a great job. Um, you know, and just, you know, we've had uh, challenges that sometimes you can't foresee, and this uh, the season's one of those. But you play through it, you work through it, and that's our plan moving forward. Uh, again, just very, very proud of the program, the success that we've had. And uh, this is just one of those, one of those things we'll have to work through as well. So, um, as you know, I did request to be the public voice this week. Uh, I thought it was best uh, to protect our players a little bit, pull them out of the uh, interview list. You'll get a chance to talk to them Saturday, certainly, and beyond that. Uh, but you know, I think in light of what's going on right now, I think it's best for us just to stay tight and keep our focus on the game at hand, because that, that is the most important thing, and that's what we owe to our 120 plus players. So that's really where our focus has been, and uh, you know, our plan is to move forward here and do our best to, to finish out this portion of the season strong. It's an eight-week season, four-week season, and we have an opportunity to do some really good things right now, and I think we're all excited about that. Uh, historically, I think this program's had 10 10 win seasons in 100 and whatever years, 1889. Uh, we got an opportunity for that and potentially beyond that too, which would be historic. So, uh, But it, it's like any game. Our focus is on doing what we can do this week. That's the only, the only, the only one that counts. What we can do this week to be successful, and that's where our focus is. So, again, I just ask you to appreciate that. And, uh, you know, there'd be plenty of other time for discussion as well, you know, after the season if we want to go back and go through all the detail, minutia, all that stuff. But I'll throw it out for questions. Scott, excuse me, Scott Docterman with The Athletic. Uh -huh. Kirk, just kind of want to know a little bit more about the timeline of events. Uh, when were you notified by, by Beth Getz regarding the, either this decision? What were the consultations like? And then the announcement, uh, when we were, you were made aware of it? I had access to the uh, announcement that you read, we all read, um, over the weekend. So, yeah, that was the timeline. Chad Lestico, Des Moines Register. Um, in light of things that have transpired, are you definitively returning yourself next season, or is that still up in the air? My plans are like the eyes are to, to worry about this game. And bigger, bigger scale, uh, bigger picture of those, for these four games. And that's, that's where my focus has been this entire season. Obviously, it's more than four games a, a week ago or two weeks ago. Uh, that, that's what I think about. And that's each and every year. It's been pretty consistent, just like the other things I referenced. David Eichholt, 24-7 Sports. Kirk, I mean, again, given the timing and this stepping away from your, your typical practice, um, Beth's still on an interim scale. I mean, is, is this going to impact your relationship going forward with Beth? And just how do you kind of balance out what the decision that's made, but also moving forward? Yeah, the only forward I'm thinking about right now is now till Saturday, and that it's been that way each and every uh, week of my career, quite frankly, and that's how you operate when you're in season. Um, you know, there's a chain of command in everything we do. Uh, Coach John Hayden Fry would frequently remind us, uh, some of the younger guys, I think he was referring to myself, and Dan McCarney could have used some time in the military to learn the chain of command, uh, and he'd throw the insubordination term around, but uh, hopefully I've never was guilty with that, of that with him uh, or anybody else. So, you know, there's, there's a chain of command to everything, and I respect that, and, uh, you yeah, know, we move forward. Uh, Tom Kaker, Hawkeye Report. Um, Kirk, I, listening to your statement, it sounded like, is your frustration with the timing that it happened before the end of the season or with the decision itself or both? No, I, I can just say that, you know, my policy has typically been to evaluate everything, players, coaches, all that, uh, postseason, because in season we've got a lot on our plates. And, um, you know, it's just kind of been the nature of it. And it's been that way probably since I got, got, got started full time in 81. You know, there's just not enough time in the day. So that's where our focus is. These, the, everything you do is precious in terms of time uh, relations. And, um, you know, so to me, it's, it's a better time. It's a less emotional time. It's, you know, I can give you a lot of reasons why I've done it that way. But, you know, it really doesn't matter. It's really not significant right now because we 
are dealing with something that we have to deal with, and we will. And that's uh, one of the points I always make to our team in camp, at the end of camp. Uh, there are a lot of factors, usually boiled down to about three or four of them, but one that never changes is how do you handle uh, the bumps that you don't anticipate, the things that uh, maybe you can't can't see coming, certainly don't see coming in August, uh, early September. So it's part, part of uh, any season, just like injuries. I mean, those are parts of seasons, and then how you respond to those things, that, that's how you get defined. And um, so, you know, this is just, it's one more of those things that you have to try to compartmentalize and put it in the right position. And then the most important question is, what do we have to do to work forward and um, you know be successful to be successful? John Steppe, Cedar Rapids Gazette. If you stay past 2023, what will be the timeline? <laughs> I could hit by a, get hit by a truck tomorrow. <laughs> like, you know, that's a reality. I figured that out a long time ago too. Um, so, assuming that you're still here 2024, what would be the timeline for finding Brian's replacement, and how much latitude would the next offensive coordinator have to make changes? Okay, so that's kind of go back here. Um, really, what I'm really worried about right now are the next four weeks. And I think anything beyond that's getting way ahead. Uh, that that would be an injustice to our football team to be thinking about any of those things that you mentioned. And that that's my first loyalty is to the football team. So you know, things are in your control, which I think this is. Uh, you know, it's just you do what you can do that's uh, going to give us our best chance to be successful, knowing that all four of these games are going to be really challenging. Uh, you know, it's not going to change. So uh, I'd really be foolish to be giving too much thought to things that are outside of the realm of that. Uh, Adam Jacoby, Go Iowa Awesome. Uh, now that you can step back and look, is there anything that you sort of regret about the uh, plan that Brian was put on, the 25 points per game and, and all of those yeah, goals? You know, I'm, I, I respect that, and I'm, I'm really not good at that, you know, looking back picture of that game because uh, it really doesn't serve much purpose, you know. Uh, I think when, when all that took place, um, you know, Brian's the one who signed it, and I think, uh, you know, he – Thought it was the best uh, best option available, and, and I would have co-signed that. Not that that was my business, but so it was. And as I said earlier, there's been a lot of really unusual things this year that I think have affected our play. Uh, if you want to look back at recent history, look at 2009. I think you could figure that one out. Uh, the the course of our season changed very dramatically. I'll go back. I'll one up you, uh, 1984, uh, and just coincidentally, it's the first weekend of November. We had a couple bumps there. Uh, we were sitting direct direct path to the Rose Bowl. Had a couple injuries, and, and things change really fast. So that, that happens in football. You just got to deal with it, and uh, you know you can't you can't worry about the eight million things that might happen here in the next two weeks. That's that. Now you talk about a waste of time. That's a waste of time too. Scott Docterman, The Athletic. Uh, I wanted to ask you about this on a personal level. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, how, do, how does this affect you in that regard? Because obviously you and Brian have a, a different relationship. Yeah, yes and no. Uh, I mean, obviously we have a biological uh, relationship, and I'm very fond of him. But uh, I've had a lot of strong relationships with a lot of people who worked here, and that's one of the beauties of what we do. So uh, if this were anybody on our staff, that fell into this category, I'd not feel bad about it, but uh, I'm guessing they would encourage us to keep moving forward too, and that's uh, you know, just what you have to do. Hi, Kirk, Shannon Earhart, KCCI. What were your emotions like when you found out? Well, again, that really is not pertinent to the uh, topic either. Um, and it, it just kind of follow up with uh, Scott just asked. You know, we're all, we're all not best friends. It's like a team. you got 120 guys, not everybody's best friends. But we all have a lot of mutual respect for each other. We all share common goals. That's one of the beauties of this sport. And one of the beauties of the sport are the, you know, the far-reaching numbers. We have 120-plus team guys on our football team. So, you know, to, to get guys to become close, to develop a chemistry, all those things, uh, that's the beauty of the game. And my 34 years here, we've had tremendous stability. Unusual. Uh, I don't, I don't want to call it rare. But yeah, it probably is rare. It's probably a fair word. I haven't done a study on it, but uh, we've had pretty good stability uh, overall for yeah my 34 years here. So that, that's one of the you know that's one of the real perks of it all. And um, you know, anytime anybody goes through a setback, it's you know you always feel bad. You know, it's just like losing a game. You feel bad about that too, but you move on. Yep. And I, we'll shift gears here to the game here at some point. I'm a lot more focused on that. Yeah. 
Kirk John Sears, WHO TV. Uh, looking back in this past year with you and your son, anything you would have done differently in the, uh, maybe to change the way things have panned out? Well, yeah, I mean, kept everybody healthy. But, uh, you know, you, again, you can't play that game. You just can't play that game. It's, it is what it is. We're at where we're at, and uh, we're moving forward. That's all you can do. So, again, uh, as always, appreciate you guys coming out. Um, thanks for joining us. You know, have had a chance to, to obviously watch the film from Northwestern uh, you know, on Sunday with uh, the staff, obviously the players. A few things stand out. Um, it's not a magic uh, button to push. You know, if you look at how we've played the last couple of games uh, on offense, the turnovers, uh, we've lost a turnover battle. Um, we're not getting them on the defensive side of the ball, on the offensive side of the ball. We're committing them. And then uh, the next part of it is the explosive plays. Uh, though we had some explosive plays uh, on the offensive side of the ball, we didn't have enough. And then defensively, we gave up some explosives. Um, I think when you look at uh, game-changing uh, plays, I would say that goal line stand against Northwestern kind of changed the complexity of the game for us because to get down inside the, the three-yard line and come away with no points, and then have the defense uh, give up a 99-yard drive uh, were the type of momentum plays that have kind of plagued us the last couple of games. Um, and for us, we've got to find a way to get back to that explosiveness on the offensive side of the ball and then on defense. Um, you know, probably was the worst tackling game we had this season. Uh, we had 16 missed tackles, which you know we tracked during the course of the year, and that was the most uh, going into um, coming out of a game. Um, but I was proud of the way our defense responded in the second half. If you looked at the fourth quarter and when we needed to get stops to get the ball back to the offense, we were able to get the necessary stops on defense, which was one of the bright spots for us. Um, offensively, being able to go down, score to pull us within six um, was huge. And then we got the, the, the defense of three and out. Uh, we preserved a lot of time there for us to, to run our two minute offense. And we came up short down there with the interception. Um, losing back-to-back -back games by one score uh, is disappointing. Um, we're a team that, you know, we talked about being ready to compete for championships, but obviously uh, we're, we're just not there yet. Um, but that won't stop us from continuing to do the necessary work to get us to that point. Um, you know, we got Penn State coming into the shell this week, uh, a team that has all of our attention. Um, they're a top 10 team, uh, one of the more talented teams in the country. Uh, you know, I look at this week as a great opportunity for us here at home. Um, they've got quite a few guys on their roster from our area. Uh, we've got only a couple from their area, uh, very familiar with their program. They're very familiar with us. Um, obviously, their, 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 their defense is one of those uh, top tier defenses. They play a lot of man coverage, which we have to be able to defeat man coverage this week. Their front seven is one of the best ones we faced or will face uh, this year. When you look at them on offense, it starts with the run game, which a year ago, I think they rushed for over 250 yards. So I would imagine that they're going to try to establish the run. Um, our goal will be to, to take the run away on the defensive side of the ball. And how do you do it? You know, if you look at the way we've played Penn State, when we've been able to have success, it's been being very aggressive um, in terms of lining guys up, attacking a line of scrimmage. And, and forcing them to throw the ball to beat us. And that's what we'll, we'll try to do this, this upcoming week. Um, their quarterback is playing at a high level. Um, you know, he made a big throw there last week in, in a critical situation, so he's very capable. Um, but like always, it's going to be more about what we do, how we prepare, and how we execute than it will be our opponent. Um, we need to try to block out as much of the outside noise that we can. Um, but we're not going to shy away from having expectations here at Maryland for our football program, and, and we embrace it. It's something that um, you know we've got to do our part, and, and it starts with me leading the program, and then everybody within the program being the best version of themselves going into the game, and then performing at a high level during the game. Um, our captains this week are uh, Jay Sean Jones, Dante Trader, who, oh, Corey Bullock will be our three game captains for, for this week. So with that, I'll open it up for questions.
Good afternoon, Mike. Dave, what's up? Another much happy Halloween. We're yeah, going to talk about the Halloween. candy tax later. Is it progressive? Is it a flat tax? Uh, you know, is a different state and you know and stuff like that. Uh, about the game Saturday, uh, Penn State brings a pass rush into College Park that leads the Big Ten in sacks. Uh, they're also number one at getting off the field on third down. They've got what Adisa Isaac, who's been a beast. W what what's the biggest challenge that they will pose your front five that's looking to bounce back from? giving up six sacks at Northwestern? I mean, they're a fast defense. And, you know, when you look at the six sacks in a Northwestern game and, and O-line coaches cringe when you hear six, but I would say we gave up three sacks. Uh, three of the sacks were scrambles where the quarterback has to throw the ball away and not just run out of bounds or get tackled for a loss. There are opportunities to get rid of the ball, but we did give up three sacks where we turned guys loose. And I can tell you with the type of pressure that they play and run on defense, it's going to be important that we're really sound on our assignments. Um, they try to give you a lot of looks. Uh, they put a lot of guys up at the line of scrimmage, and we're going to have a bunch of one-on-one -on -one battles that we're going to have to compete. Um, but we also can help. If you look the last few weeks, we, we've run a lot of screens, which are kind of the, the antivirus for, for pressure. Um, and we've hit a couple, and we've kind of become a little efficient there. But we've got to do a lot of different things on offense to slow down their rush. I mean, they're very talented front seven athletic 50 percent of the snaps are some form of pressure and they play man coverage and so to me those are the challenges on defense uh we've got good players on our side of the ball that we've got to get to play to the best of their ability and we've got to win some of these one-on-one -on -one matchups whether it's in protection or whether it's in coverage hey mike in addition to telling us that after the North northwestern game that you wanted to evaluate everything from top to bottom you mentioned players need to make plays how much is that being reinforced to the stars, particularly guys like Talia, you know, two turnovers, tie with a drop, some deep primary defenders, missed tackles, that kind of thing? Yeah, that's the great thing about this team, Gene, is that uh, they, they've, they're all in. They bought into the accountability piece, and it starts with modeling at the top. I mean, uh, it's my responsibility to have us ready to play. Um, I didn't think the last couple of games we came out with the mentality that we need to. You know, it's a little different uh, program now because, you know, Maryland is now a team that gets hunted uh, before we show up and people say, oh, it's Maryland. And, and maybe they approach the game with the mentality of it's just Maryland. But right now, I don't think very many people when we show up say, hey, it's just Maryland. And so what our team has to do when we take this next step to become a championship type program is we've got to be able to learn how to play when you are the favorite, when you are expected to win. And those expectations are ones we're not going to shy away from. Following that, we've heard the cliche that losing can be contagious. What do you do in practice to kind of make sure that doesn't you know, translate to next week and You know what, it, it's, we, we, we always are defined by the present. We're not defined in what's happened in the past and we can't look too far forward. And right now it's about Penn State, it's about this game. Uh, the last three or four games have no bearing on this one other than for us to evaluate what we're doing as we have. And as I said, there's no uh, – When I, I've said this a lot in here. Our winning formula is winning the explosive play battle and winning the turnover battle. The last two games we haven't done that. We've lost by one score, and, and, and it's up to us as a coaching staff to put us in position to make those plays uh, and have the right guys in there, and it's up to the players to, to make the plays. And each and every one of us have accepted that responsibility and the accountability that goes along with it. Hey, Coach. Varun, what's up? You talked about how at the before the season you guys had these goals of Big Ten championships. Mm -hmm. Uh, and now you say that you're not ready. When you look at the team from the beginning of the season to now, what is the biggest difference that leads to that change in evaluation? Well, I said we're going ready to compete for Big Ten championships. Okay. So let's make sure we put the okay. whole quote in. And we're still ready to compete for Big Ten championships. Just right now, uh, we've shown the last couple of weeks that we're just not there yet. And how do I evaluate it? By the scoreboard. That's why they keep score. We've lost the last two um, to teams that going into it, uh, teams that are in the Big Ten, that we, we need to be able to compete and win those games. We didn't do it this week, the last couple of weeks. And you've talked a lot about the player-led leadership on this team in this you know, tough stretch. Where have you seen it the most and who have you seen it from the most? Uh, by the how they show up and work. Um, you know, after the game Saturday, I met Sunday with a bunch of our leaders. Uh, I had a leadership meeting yesterday before practice to, to gauge where we, we, where we are. And I can tell you the same way that we felt as coaches after that game is the same way our players felt that, again, we let another game slip away that 
it, it really came down to what we did more than anything. And so to take the accountability, we've got to do us better. We've got to do the things we do better um, and more consistently. And that's where me as the leader have to, has to get us playing and doing those things more consistent. Um, Coach, you talked a little bit about Drew Aller. He's only got one interception all season as a, as a sophomore. Just how impressive is that for, for yeah, a quarterback? Protecting to be, the ball yeah. is really important at that position because of how much they, they're exposed to, to it. And, you know, he's taking care of the football. Uh, they've run the ball efficiently for the most part. They've got two big time running backs. Both those guys are really talented. Probably one of the better O line in the country. So, um, yeah, as a, a quarterback, when you protect the ball the way he has and, and has managed and done the things to put him in this position, he's playing at a really high level. Hey, Coach. Brandon, what's up? Tyrese Chambers left the team last week. What was the reasoning behind that? You know, they're all personal reasons. You know, Tyrese is one of those great kids that joined our program, um, you know, for a year. He left for personal reasons. He has a few things going on in his life that he felt he needs to take care of. We're in true, full support of him. Uh, still in school, finishing up classes, uh, you know, still has access to the academic stuff that we do for him. But um, as with anything, when guys leave the program, everyone leaves for whatever their own personal reasons, and we'll support Tyrese as he continues to move forward. Hey, Coach. Taylor, what's up? What's up? Um, after the game on Saturday, talking about penalties, specifically after the whistle, you said, I got to get that fixed. There's a moment earlier this year, Antoine Littleton, I think it was an unsportsmanlike conduct, and you benched him for the rest of the game. Is that form of discipline something we could start to see more of moving forward? It's something that I evaluate, and just like, uh, you know, you, you probably you don't have kids yet, right? You know, you, 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 you raise each kid a little, you got to figure out who the kid is, and then you figure out the punishment, but there's no cookie cutter. So I'm not going to let you box me into saying, is that what you expect? For, uh, it depends on the game, depends on the, the type of penalty, what happened. I try to evaluate it all, but I try not to be as emotional in making these decisions. But, you know, we're fifth, I think, in the Big Ten in penalties. Uh, I thought this past Saturday, you know, those unsportsmanlike are the ones that really get under my skin because they're about having discipline and, and not being emotional. And most of the time, it's the second guy responding more than it is the first. And we've got to be a team that understands, take care of those things within the whistle and not after the whistle. Hey, Coach, with hey, uh, James Franklin, he's obviously – you guys coached together for a while. What stands out to you most about him and what's your guys' relationship like now? Uh, we have a great working relationship. We see each other when we see each other. You know, we don't text Merry Christmas to each other. Um, he's a head coach in the Big Ten. We see each other when we do Big Ten things and type of relationship we have. I don't know what you want me to say. Okay. <laughs> 